Hello, well done. It was it was a great panel session, uh, but you didn't have much time. So you, this, now you've got a chance, perhaps, to say a little bit more about some of those things you touched on and then tantalised us because you, you abandoned them too quickly. I mean, basically, you, you were saying the world class, a world class university strategy. The, your question was, does it flow to all boats? And your answer, pretty obviously, was no, it doesn't. Um, <clears throat> what it tends to do is concentrate resources and reinforce privilege and, and the elite sort of elite status rather than distribute it. And you ended by saying we need to own the problem, not just describe it. So, so say a bit more about that. Please. Okay, well, I mean, some, first of all, some of the um, owning of the problem is also the problems in society in general. So universities tend to, what we've all done is we just, quote, claim, educate students and graduate them. Once they're out the door, they're not our problem. So we have problems in our primary schools. We have problems of health, we have problems in our communities. But we've educated the people going out, but we don't care anything once they've left the place. We don't care about the quality of what's going on in the schools, right. except to complain that somehow the government isn't doing X, Y, and Z. But we've trained the teachers. So what are we doing? Why are we not owning that problem? So that's what I mean about trying to own the problem, not just educating students and letting them out the door. And Certainly education issues, education in itself can't solve all of the issues, but it has a role and responsibilities. It has clear role yeah. and responsibilities. So that's about that's really an argument for a, an extended role in social engagement for the universities. It's it's engagement. even more. I mean, <laughs> what what are they doing in terms of teacher training? Hmm. What's actually going on in the teacher training scenario? Are we poorly educating them that when they hit the schools, they're poor teachers, or are they fantastic teachers and they haven't actually been taught to work in a diversified educational system because the education system is actually extraordinarily diverse? What are we doing about recruiting in, making sure that our student population who are student teacher trainers? So the t teaching is, is Anyways, I'm suggesting that we have that university have a bigger role than just yeah. graduating the student out the door in terms of owning of owning the issue. Yeah. Um, that's one way of owning the problem. Okay. And and um, one of the questions that came from the floor in the panel session was, how do we start to redefine excellence? Mm. I think it was Sue Ellen Shea from Cape Town who, who said that. Yeah. And, and so I mean. That's also a, a good challenge, as it were, to the panel as well. It's a huge challenge because <clears throat> even on the issue of quality, we have no, there's no agreed definition of what mm. we mean by quality. We can argue, arguably, quality and excellence is something that comes with, um, is based in context, and we can understand why it's largely context driven, and we can say what are there different types of quality, or so we might understand that. But to the external public, their question is, well, do you not have common standards? Sure. If you look at the PIAC uh, survey, which is a survey of adult skills, which the OECD does, the results are shocking. 25 to 30 percent of graduates, now varies per country, um, are grad of adults who have been through education systems have poor literacy and numeracy skills in some cases, lower than second level students wow. in other countries. Really? Wow. So this is kind of shocking. This is again part of owning the problem. What are we doing in the education system that the graduates coming out are so poor? So what happens is we tend to blame the system previous to us. So we yes. blame the high schools, the high schools blame the primary schools, someone else blames the parents and so on. Okay, yeah. so it's a multifactorial. Sure. set of, of issues, but nonetheless, how we look at issues around learning and learning outcomes and um, coming to some, is what I tend to say is, you need to start driving the bus, you need to be engaged in this discussion. And, and there is an inherent problem, as you, as you said, quality is a complicated thing and there's no agreed way of, of actually assessing yeah, that, it's very contingent on local situations. But of course, people outside the universities and higher education want a simple answer to the question: of, Is this any good? Absolutely. And, and that so inherently, it's it's a, it's a tricky problem. It's a very it's tricky a problem, problem, and that's problem. exactly. And so <clears throat> we do end up with 
very simplistic solutions to complex yeah. problems, partially because they're easily usable and rankings are very easy to use. Yeah. They're simple, and whatever you think about them, we all use them. So if there's any conversation you can do at a government level or at somewhere else, that's somewhere in that conversation or in your descriptive brief that you've written or you've been given or whatever, you will describe the positioning and the rankings. Mm. Because despite everything, they tell us something. Now it's not clear, they, you know, they tell us something within the positioning of the country within the global geopolitical yeah. environment. And people will be looking at the standing of UK universities vis-a-vis -vis the rankings apropos Brexit. That will certainly be a big talking <clears throat> point. Yeah. And the universities are using that as an argument on their own behalf. And, and that, in, I mean, that's, and the question very often is, back to that thing of how do we start to redefine excellence, one way is to, is to actually change change the way things are measured or, or assessed. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe an alternative is, is to go further than that and say, well, let's not let, let's leave that self-defined elite in one place and let's try and develop another elite based on a different idea of excellence. And, and, and maybe that would maybe that would be a more effective strategy in the, in the medium term. Yeah. So 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 you could say, okay, all the, all the things that people were talking about in terms of inclusivity and social justice. Maybe you can actually define an elite um, based on more on those kinds of things, and then start pouring the funds into that. On, on you know, and, and as you said, you know, universities chase money like nothing else. Absolutely, they're very good at chasing <coughs> money and do it a lot for a very relatively little yes. sums. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I expect that's that's certainly the case. I mean, at the end of the day, there's something like nine percent of students in the UK go to Oxford or Russell Group Universities. Mm. In the US it's about 1 or 2 percent go to the Ivy League, yeah. but they're the ones who get all the publicity. Yes. They're the ones that drive, that effectively their outcomes drive, or their role drives policy, they have the loudest lobbying voice. Yeah. So then I look at and talk a lot about world class systems, so what might that look like? And how might you, you you shift the way in which you are both funding institutions and can you also come, come up with an agreed vision as to what the, the, um, the vision of, of, of the education system or the societal vision is in, let's say, 2040, 2050. So the Welsh have, have come up with their uh, issue on, on the future of Wales. Yeah. They have a vision for where they want to go. Now, it's not all that well defined and so on, because you can't write every bullet point. But it's, it's a bit like, um, you know, uh, uh, poverty. Uh, well, we would have some legislation in the Irish case where you need to poverty-proof your legislation. Yeah. Um, so in this case, mm -hmm. you might need to climate change your, your legislation. Yeah. But there are ways in which you set you define your system according to different sets. So, of so criteria. you need to find those topically powerful themes. Yeah, that and I'd yeah, yeah I'd be suggesting it's it's a collective endeavor yeah. because the universities also spend a lot of time talking about representing the public good, but all they're doing is asserting their own self interest and suggesting that we are the public good, yeah. therefore we should be the funded. Yeah. Um, it's not clear that there is a common view of what the public good is. Now, sometimes we may not want to hear that, but um, it's Cause, kind Because that touches on another thing you mentioned, which is that it's... Because some people would, were just saying it's all about neoliberalism, yeah. uh, and, and you made the point that actually it's underlying that very often there's, there's an issue of accountability. Yeah. And that's, that's really exactly what you're saying. You know? Yeah, I mean, there is a huge accountability issue. I mean, how many times, even in, in simple days, I remember, okay, so I was the vice president for about 20 years, but I, running one of, the fa one of our faculties, I had a member of staff, you know, and they're marking people on numbers, and, you know, the student comes up with, let's say, a 49. Or, you know, you know and you have to say, you know, someone's going to ask you why that's not a 50. Yeah. What's, what's the basis on which you made this? Yeah. Or, you know, I mean, student, 
students, you know, we all have a have a right the institutions have not been very accountable. Mm. The focus on learning outcomes is one, but there are bigger sets of issues. Yeah. Um, they're not all a university issue, um, but there is an issue around supply and demand. Um, there's issue about the absorptive capacity within the regions. Um, but it's a complex set of issues, but certainly the accountability agenda is one that is that train has left the station and it's down the track. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you see governments everywhere introducing mechanisms and the academy by and large has just sat and critiqued it. Yeah. So or you, claimed... You must let us be autonomous because yes. otherwise we can't do all these marvelous yes, things that we do absolutely. already. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it doesn't matter if they don't need to be the Russell Group to be making that claim. No, no, absolutely not. And, and, and I think it's interesting that... Um, it's interesting that Yes, governments must do that because education, higher education is very expensive. It costs a large chunk of, 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 of the, the, the public budget. Um, it's interesting to me that um, mass higher education, by which I mean you know, more than 40%, 50%, in some cases 50 even higher in some countries, percent of uh, the rising cohorts going into universities, um, seems not to have changed this situation very much. No, no, because I think largely, well, we've got a range of different factors, uh, not just parental and student choice issues, but we've also expanded the middle class, um, and we have deep pockets of, of an inequality, and the basic literature says that children by the age of five, their path has largely already been determined. Mm. So... Arguably, there should be more money in preschool, yes. not in the universities. Mm. Yes. That's not a very... <laughs> or you need to target your money at the university level. Sure. Um, and you need to target it to people who are more likely to require it yeah. and need, those, need assistance. You need to look at a more diversified post-secondary system. So if you look again at what Wales is is doing um, you need to look at the post-secondary system as a much more fluid and um, not just horizontally diverse but also fluid over age yeah um, but it's a reconceptualization of how the how the system operates and how we use the money yeah effectively for it because money is always tight and arguably, yes. you could you could say you know conversely, rather than giving it to those who do best, give it to those who who are the weakest. Yes. Why wouldn't we do that? Whether well, we tend to use it to get people to do better, but maybe those who are weakest are and weak, yeah, sure. and all we're doing is reinforcing <laughs> their weakness. So one of the issues that comes out of that paper I quoted, I mean, it was looking at a different set of issues, but. Um, was really, you know, it is the, really the Matthew effect of the uh, accumulated advantages, yeah. uh, which also includes the capacity to make decisions, and it's all its capacity, where if you look at smaller, weaker organizations or infrastructure, the personnel infrastructure tends to be weaker, yeah. Yeah. and yet these are the ones that we need to be stronger. Yeah, there's a lot of... Um what somebody was calling this week evidence resistant policy being, being made in, in yeah. this territory, isn't it? Well, the other side of it is the argument that I was critiquing, the neoliberal one, is um, we've been through you know, simple solutions to complex problems. This is a simple slogan to a complex set of issues, mm. and look where we are. Between the US, the UK, and others, we have simple solutions to complex problems. Yeah. And let's just come back to rankings for one last yeah. question, if, if I may. You, the, uh, Paul Temple wrote a blog for SRHE a few months back which, which was criticising the fact that the Times Higher Ed, and I know you were critical of their ranking anyway, more critical of theirs than most, I guess. Um, Times Higher Ed not only publishes rankings, it also sells consultancy about how to go up the rankings, which, um, which seems morally questionable. Yes, yeah, I think we have to look at this whole area that's really quite explosive around big data. Yeah. Higher education big data is a really big issue. 
Yeah. Um, they, uh, rankings were at the beginning of it, but it has certainly been an explosion. We have an interconnectivity between the rankings of publishers, big data organizations, data analytics, the research management and information management tools we use in our, in our institutions and that governments use, and it is the monetization of this higher education data. With regard to the ranking companies, they all uh, operate a consultancy on the side for very large sums paid by both universities and governments. Yeah. They hold conferences, they multiply their product as anyone does, not just producing pairs, but we have pairs like this and pairs like this. And, you know, we have multiples of different yeah. rankings. Yeah. They're all time to come up with particular things. The rankings, uh, the business side of the rankings and that are pulling in more money than the newspaper. Yeah. This is exactly what happened with the U.S. News and World Report, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, in which they stopped doing that. Now they do lots of rankings for lots of sectors, not just AG. But, um, and it is, um, big data is big business. Yeah. And there is very little serious work that has gone on about these interconnectivities. Indeed, we're discussing open access at the moment across the year, across the EU, and internationally, it's now a huge issue, open access. The publishers are connected into it very tightly with the ranking organizations. Mm. <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of depressing, Alan, in some ways, but, but the optimism I take from it is that universities will change quite rapidly for quite small amounts of money. Sometimes. Yes. <laughs> Let's cling to that. Thank you very much. <laughs>